morning. We're going to begin our appropriations meeting as a subcommittee and allow members to mosey on over to committee. Uh, I know it's always tough on a Monday morning, but if I can be here, so can everybody else. I uh, appreciate the timeliness. Uh, we have 49 bills on file, uh, 10 of which are eligible for due pass, have due pass recommendations. The remaining bills are suspense items. If anyone is here to testify on AB 375 by Assemblywoman Campos, that bill has been rescheduled for a later hearing. I'd also like to remind the audience again and members that testimony should be limited to the fiscal aspects of the bill. Uh, majority of the bills, well, all the bills have already had a lengthy policy discussion, if not one, but two. So uh, please refrain from making lengthy comments. And again, if sergeants can continue to call members, um, uh, if at all possible, we are going to try to finish before 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock floor session. Otherwise, we'll have to recess and come back and finish afterwards. We do have uh, our author with us, Senator Mani. Oh, we do have a quorum now. Perfect. Good morning. Uh, why don't we establish quorum? Secretary, please call the roll. Laura? Here. Laura, here. Bates? Here. Bates, here. Bell? Hill? Here. Hill, here. Leva? Here. Leva, here. Mendoza? Here. Mendoza, here. Nielsen? We have a quorum. Uh, we have our first item, SB members, this is SB 657, Senator Monning. Uh, this item is a suspense candidate. Senator Monning, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair and members, and acknowledge this is a candidate for suspense. Just wanted to offer a few quick comments. Um, Senate Bill 657 codifies and requires the California Public Utilities Commission to convene an independent peer review panel to conduct an independent review of enhanced seismic studies and surveys of the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant until August 26, 2025, which is when the license uh, would expire. As the analysis points out, the panel is contracted by the PUC, but the operator of Diablo Canyon PG&E is the one that pays and reimburses those costs. PG&E in turn passes those costs to ratepayers and has been doing so for the past five years. SB 657 is a responsible state action to ensure independent peer review of the Diablo Canyon power plant to enhance the seismic safety on the plant and to protect the public safety. Furthermore, having the panel's expertise available to the PUC could lead to better, more cost-effective decision-making on behalf of all ratepayers. Uh, so members, when it does come um, for consideration, I would urge your I vote to move this off suspense, and Mr. Chair, I believe there's some uh, witnesses here to comment. Thank you. Witnesses in support. Mr. Chair, the members, Paul Yoder. Mr. Chair, the members, Paul Yoder, on behalf of the uh, San Luis Obispo County Board of Supervisors in support of the bill. Thank you. Thank you. Additional witnesses in support. Witnesses in opposition. Finance. Jacqueline Wong Hernandez with the Department of Finance. We don't have a position on this bill. We note that the PUC estimates the bill requires approximately $200,000 annually over the 10-year extension period, a level equivalent to the panel's current annual expenditures. As the author noted, this additional um, funding will be paid by pg and &E and supported by ratepayers. Thank you. Comments or questions from committee? Seeing none, uh, Senator Monning, thank you. Would you like to close? No, just uh, again, we'll appreciate your consideration at the appropriate time. Thank you. Thank you. Without objection, we'll move this item to the suspense file. Members, seeing that we uh, don't, see, I don't see any authors, we are going to move through the agenda for those uh, items that we've, members have waived presentation to allow members of the public to add if they so choose. We are going to begin with Assemblyman Gibson. This is AB 25. Witnesses in support? Witnesses in opposition? Finance? It's okay. We don't have a um, position on this bill at this time, but we note that it, it could increase general fund costs by hundreds of thousands of dollars based on the amount of Cal Grant awards previously made to students at institutions that are now ineligible for the program because of the performance of small cohorts. Additionally, the bill likely creates costs in the tens of thousands of dollars um, to the commission to establish and administer a formal appeals process as required by the bill. Thank you. Comments or questions from committee? Without objection, we're gonna move this item to the suspense file. AB, next item is AB 835, Senator Gibson, witnesses in support, witnesses in opposition, finance. 
We're opposed to this bill because it could increase the state prison population, which impacts the state's ability to comply with the federal court orders, court's order to reduce prison overcrowding to 137.5% of design capacity. Um, as I frequently note in here, the state is currently staying um, below the population cap by utilizing the current court ordered population reduction measures, which also, which includes contracting for thousands of beds, including California City and operating the California Rehabilitation Center. Because we have to stay below the population cap into the future, measures that increase the prison population are problematic. Thank you. Comments or questions from committee? Without objection, seeing none, without objection, we'll move this item to a suspense file. We have a uh, Senator Otano, please uh, come forward. That is members item, you have two items, uh, AB 531 and 566. Why don't we begin with AB 531? Great. Floor uh, yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Today I'm presenting AB 531, which addresses a concern that some in the education community have expressed regarding the school district budget reserve cap. Last year's budget trailer bill included a provision that limits the amount of monies that districts can set aside and assigned and unassigned reserves in the year following a transfer of funds into the state Proposition 98 reserve. One of the major concerns raised by opponents of the reserve cap is that it forces districts to spend down monies they have been saving for a specific future purpose, such as a major instructional materials purchase or deferred maintenance. AB 531 addresses this concern by making it clear that money set aside in a committed reserve are exempt from the cap. Districts can use the committed reserve, which is recognized by the California School Accountability Accounting Manual, to set aside as many dollars as they deem necessary for future expenditures, even if the cap on assigned and unassigned reserves is imposed. I respectfully ask for an I vote. Thank you. Witnesses in support of this item. Witnesses in opposition. Finance. We don't see a state impact of this bill. There's a motion by Senator Leva. Uh, Senator O'Donnell, would you like to close? Respectfully ask your I vote. Oh, there's a question by our vice chair. Uh, yeah, just a comment. Uh, you know, there's been uh, a few bills uh, to repeal the cap. Correct. Uh, I, I'm concerned that the impacts here are certainly negative on the school districts. We have a letter that was signed by uh, most of the uh, um, assembly member Democrats that says the current cap on school district reserves has the potential for several negative impacts, including school districts paying higher interest on bonded indebtedness. These higher interest rates result in taxpayers paying more and schools having less money for instruction and programs such as career technical education. I believe that CTE is absolutely vital as we look at uh, our uh, state going into the new green economy. Additionally, the cap leaves school districts more vulnerable to insolvency during economic downturns by forcing them to maintain inadequate reserves that equal only a few days of cash flow. I guess what I'm saying, uh, colleagues, is I, I think this should go to suspense. I think we should try to work something out where we can actually repeal um, the um, requirement on the reserves that, that they're capped, and that would provide a great opportunity for uh, Assembly Member O'Donnell to be a hero to the schools. Uh, we really need to do this. I feel very uh, strongly, and I think this letter speaks to that, uh, Senator Lara. So that would be my suggestion. Thank you, Sen Senator Bates. Uh, uh, there is a motion. Secretary, please call the roll on this item. The motion is due pass to the Senate floor. Lara? Aye. Laura, aye. Bates? Aye. Bates, aye. Bell? Hill? Hill, aye. Leva? Leva, aye. Mendoza? Mendoza, aye. Nielsen? Five to zero. We're going to hold this item open to allow our other members to come in and add on. Your next item is AB 566. Floor is yours. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, AB 566 requires contractors and any subcontractors for school district lease, leaseback, and lease owned projects to use a skilled and trained workforce. Lease, leaseback allows a school district to bypass the competitive bidding process. This bill will provide some assurances that we are getting a quality product. This bill will not result in a loss of costs, in a lot of costs. Most school districts have established a pre qualification process already. And lease-leaseback is an option, not a requirement. 
There will also be savings from not having to do repairs on any substandard job. And with that, uh, I do have a Thank witness you. here. Witnesses in support. Mr. Chair, members, Cesar Diaz on behalf of the State Building Construction T Trades Council, uh, here in support of the legislation, we do see that there has been a rampant issues happening with lease leaseback. There has been several reports by newspaper art uh, throughout the state that cite that there's lack of competitive bidding, lack of public accountability, and transparency when these projects are awarded. And they are source sourced, awarded, basically without any competitive bidding. So this provide that type of public accountability that will ensure cost savings in the long run because you have a skilled workforce that's already actually attributed to the prevailing wage. So for those reasons, we support the bill. Thank you. Petitioner, when is this in support? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, Mitch Seaman with the California Labor Federation also here in support. As mentioned, we think this bill offers the kind of accountability that we need to make sure this program works for all involved and we urge your support. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman and members, Sam Merlino on behalf of the California Field Iron Workers Labor Management Cooperative Trust, also in support of this bill. Thank you. Additional witnesses in support. Witnesses in opposition. Mr. Chairman, members, Richard Markson for the Plumbing, Heating, and Cooling Contractors of California, the Air Conditioning Trade Association, Western Electrical Contractors Association, and the Associated Builders and Contractors of San Diego. Uh, the analysis points to both state and uh, school agency costs. However, we have policy objections. We're opposed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senators, Julie Ann Broyles here on behalf of Associated Builders and Contractors of California. Uh, also in opposition, we are concerned that it's going to put new unnecessary restrictions that will limit the pool of contractors available to bid on or be awarded contracts under the lease leaseback process if they are funded by school bonds or reimbursed by school bond proceeds. For those reasons, we oppose the bill. Thank you. Additional witnesses in opposition. Please come forward. Um, Go ahead. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members, Tom Duffy for the Coalition for Adequate School Housing. We do not have a position of opposition or support on this bill. We have suggested, however, that this bill will be difficult to implement and have suggested that it can be amended and create goals that would not increase the cost of the projects uh, that are built uh, through, through state bonds and, and local bonds. Uh, in your analysis uh, from your committee staff, it's identified that the cost could be as much as $600,000 per project. To put that in uh, context, that would represent about two classrooms worth of, of pupils, about 60 pupils. Uh, so in, in essence, you would, w with this bill in place in the future, it could limit the building of two classrooms if everything else were to be uh, held equal. So our suggestion is we all want a quality workforce. We, we believe that there needs to be some type of competitive process, uh, but we suggest that this bill is really not the way to do it the way it's written. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Finance. We don't have a position on this bill at this time, but we would note that it would result in unknown costs to school districts to modify pre-qualification processes. There's also an unknown fiscal impact related to overall construction and contract costs as a result of the skilled workforce requirements of the bill. The requirement for a skilled workforce, um, as defined in the bill, could reduce the pool of qualified candidates, which could lead to higher overall project costs, including K-12 facilities bond cost pressures. However, um, pre-qualification and skilled labor requirements may also result in overall savings to the extent that some less qualified contractors are disqualified or discouraged from bidding. Thank you. Uh, comments or questions from committee? Seeing none, uh, Senator O'Donnell, would you like to close? I respectfully ask for an I vote. Thank you. Uh, there's a motion by Senator Leva. Secretary, please call the roll. The motion is due pass to the Senate floor. Laura? Aye. Laura, aye. Bates? No. Bates, aye. no. So two pass. Bell? Hill? Aye. Hill, aye. Leva? Aye. Leva, aye. Mendoza? Aye. Mendoza, aye. Nielsen? So we're going to keep that uh, item open to allow our members to add on. I appreciate you. Thank you. Go Beach. <laughs> Next we have, uh, in file order, we have Assemblyman Burke. <coughs> Please come forward. Assemblyman Burke, you have four items, suspense candidates, 
Uh, let's begin with your first item is AB 852. Please Thank proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senators. Assembly Bill 852 expands the definition of public works to include construction, alteration, demolition, installation, or repair work on a general acute care hospital project that uh, is paid for using tax exempt conduit revenue bonds issued on or after January 1st, 2016. AB 852 will ensure that workers on these publicly subsidized projects are paid a livable wage and that the most skilled and qualified workers are building these complex medical facilities. I respectfully ask for your eye vote. Thank you. Um, witnesses and support. Mr. Chair, member says RDLs on behalf of the State Building Trades Council uh, supporting this bill. The issue of bond conduit financing uh, does have an impact to general bonds uh, if the issuer and the actual payee uh, defiles bankruptcy. That impacts the state's credit rating as well. So we do believe those two are tied together even though the actual private party is paying the money back. Also with respects to adding on something to the analysis, under last year's statutes, AB, SB 854, the state created a public works fund uh, that's derived out of contractor fees for all contractors working on public works projects. So all of those fees pay for the entirety of the uh, enforcement of the Department of Industrial Relations that would be uh, created by this bill to enforce the prevailing wage. So for those reasons, we uh, urge your support when it comes off suspense. Thank you. Correct. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Mitch Seaman with the uh, California Labor Federation also here in support. This bill is an important clarification to make sure that workers earn what they deserve and we urge your support at the appropriate time. Thank you. Additional witnesses in support. Witnesses in opposition, please come forward. Finance. This bill could result in costs of $125,000 um, to the Public Works Enforcement Fund annually for the Department of Industrial Relations to hire an additional staff member to monitor and enforce new prevailing wage requirement as it pertains to general acute care hospitals that receive conduit revenue bond funding. The exact scope of additional enforcement cases um, that may be generated as a result of the bill is unclear at this time, but those are the costs that DIR is reporting. Um, the Department of Finance does not necessarily concur with current cost estimates, and we would note that any request for additional resources will be evaluated in detail during the annual budget development process. Thank you. Comments or questions from committee? It's uh, kind of for suspense, Senator Leva, but I appreciate, <laughs> appreciate the willingness. Uh, Senator Burke, would you like to close? Uh, I respectfully ask for your eye vote. When the Thank you. Without objection, uh, we will move this item to suspense. Next item is AB 1261. All of us want to remain in our own homes and communities as we get older, and every day adult day health care centers help thousands of frail Californians do just that. Unfortunately, after nearly a decade of instability, programs across the state have closed their doors, leaving individuals with few choices for care outside of a nursing home. In my district alone, four centers have clo closed, leaving over 420 of my constituents without the care that they had relied upon. AB 1261 provides some stability to our remaining providers in the community-based adult service program. The bill aligns state law with Bridge to Reform Waiver that currently governs adult day health care in California and requires Medi-Cal managed care plans to reimburse contracted providers at rates that are no less than the Medi-Cal fee-for-service rates. There's no opposition and the bill has a broad bipartisan support. We are continuing to work with the administration on amendments to preserve the current program without generating additional costs. I respectfully request your I vote when you consider the suspense one. Thank you. Witnesses in support. Laurel Mildred on behalf of California's 241 community-based adult services CBAS providers. Um, we're in strong support of this bill. Um, we note that the program costs are currently accounted for in the state budget and we appreciated that the analysis um, also mentioned that there are potential cost savings from this program's prevention of institutionalization. We respectfully request your I vote. Thank you. Jerry Gonzalez with AARP and its 3.2 million members in support. Thank you. Additional witnesses in support. Witnesses in opposition. Finance. The Department of Finance is opposed to this bill. Um, the Medi-Cal program spends $328 million, 164 million of which are general fund, annually on community-based adult services at 245 centers in 26 counties. The bill expands these services to all 58 counties, which will likely increase the amount of beneficiaries in the program and result in potentially significant general fund costs. The requirement that managed care plans reimburse service providers at no less than the fee-for-service equivalent doesn't have a current fiscal impact as managed care plans are typically already paying providers at that level. 
However, setting a minimum level for provider reimbursement may prevent managed care plans from negotiating better reimbursement terms in the future. Thank you. Comments or questions from committee? Seeing none, would you like to close? I respectfully request your eye vote when considering the suspense file. Thank you. We would, uh, without objection, we'll move this item to suspense. Your next item is AB 1361. Go ahead. Mr. Chair and Senators, Assembly Bill 1361 provides current and former members of the Armed Forces greater access to higher education by removing the age eligibility requirement in order to qualify for the Cal Grant Transfer Entitlement Program. Current law requires a student to be the age of 27 or younger in order to be eligible for the Cal Grant Transfer Entitlement Program. Unfortunately, the age eligibility requirement presents a barrier for veterans who attend college later in life due to their prior service in the military. AB 1361 will remove this barrier and ensure that veterans have access to financial aid and are able to, to uh, pursue their educational goals. I respectfully ask for your aye vote when considering the suspense file. Thank you. Witnesses in support. Good morning, Chair, members of the committee. I'm Michael McGee with California Community Colleges. We are in support of this measure based on the policy. With respect to costs, we're not, unable to provide specific data points, but do believe, as the analysis indicates, that the numbers will be very small. Thank you. This is Brandon Biggert with the California Student Aid Commission. I concur with everything that Mike just said, and we support the bill at the Student Aid Commission. We think that it's important to continue to uh, maintain our commitment to education for those who choose to join the military when they get out Thank and come you. back to school. Witness, additional witnesses in support. Witnesses in opposition. Please come forward. Uh, Ryan McLean with Community College of California. I apologize for getting up here a little late, but we are in support of the bill. Um, Too late. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're not in opposition. I just, uh, for the reasons previously stated, so apologies. Thank you. Finance. The Student Aid Commission um, provided us with an estimate that about 200 veterans would be eligible for a Cal Grant as a result of this bill, creating costs of $1.5 million in 2016-17 um, based on the average award amounts. However, we would note that um, it's unclear how many of these veterans are likely to choose to utilize the state benefit, um, and so, so costs would be dependent on individual choices. Thank you. Uh, comments or questions from committee? Would you like to close? I respectfully ask for your I vote when considering the suspense file. Thank you. Without objection, we'll move this item to suspense. Your last item <laughs> is AB 1436 uh, in the Burke Show. Go ahead. There we go. Mr. Ch Mr. Chair and Senators, AB 1436 allows individuals in the IHSS program to designate an authorized representative to act on his or her behalf when it comes to various program functions, from the initial application to negotiating caregiver hours and services. A number of programs overseen by the state already have processes in place, allowing their applicants and recipients to identify an authorized representative. AB 1436 extends that same allowance to IHSS consumers. While I appreciate the fiscal estimate noticed in the analysis, I think it's worth noting that establishing a formal process should eliminate some of the confusion that currently exists. For example, the state has at times issued IHSS forms and all county letters referencing authorized representatives, but the department has never defined who an authorized representative is or established a process for an IHSS applicant or consumer to designate one. Forms developed by the department that have space for an authorized representative to sign have required counties to develop internal processes for designating a representative, which may vary by county. AB 1436 will end the confusion and patchwork interpretations across the counties. It streamlines oper operations and has the added benefit of giving frail Californians an option to designate someone to work on their behalf through the complex web of paperwork and requirements in the IHSS system. We'll continue to work with your staff and the administration while the bill is on suspense to iron out any inconsistencies or issues that may have inflated the estimated cost of implementation. And I respectfully request your I vote at the appropriate time. Thank you. Witnesses in support. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Kathy Sunderling McDonald with the County Welfare Directors Association. We're the sponsor of the legislation. And I agree with Assembly Member Burke's analysis that today there is a patchwork of 58 processes because there is no standardized way for us to designate in, in the counties and be able to monitor and um, approve authorized representatives. So while there would be costs associated with developing the new procedures and the following the new procedures, we're not starting from scratch. We are starting from a situation where counties are kind of winging it and we'd really prefer to have one statewide standardized way of doing it, which we think in the end will actually cost less and be much more more efficient for the program. 
We'd also note and appreciate the comments and the analysis that the um, there may be increased cost to the program from people having um, a better means of communicating their needs and navigating the eligibility and enrollment process. However, it seems likely that those with the most impairments would be the most likely to benefit and therefore the offsetting savings that are noted in the analysis as well from those individuals not being institutionalized or requiring more expensive levels of care are thus also the most likely to materialize, thus making the bill a wash. And so we really appreciate consideration while it's on suspense. Thank you. Thanks. Cindy Hillary, on behalf of the 34 rural counties in California, we see this as a, definitely um, an improvement for small and rural counties who have very limited staff to help the most impaired with their paperwork. This would help them because with a designated represent, representative, county employees would be less called upon to help those most impaired with their paperwork and it would help them get those who need the services, the services most efficiently. Thank you. Nicole Wardleman on behalf of the Alameda County Board of Supervisors and Ventura County Board of Supervisors. Urban counties are also very supportive of this change. Thank you. Andrew Langley on behalf of Contra Costa County in support. Thank you. Additional witnesses in support. Witnesses in opposition. Finance. Department of Finance is neutral on this bill as it may help counties better serve IHSS recipients who wish to designate an authorized representative to act on their behalf. We think that the department would incur minor and absorbable costs to develop the required form and procedures. Thank you. Comments or questions from committee? Seeing none, Senator Burke, would you like to close? I respectfully oh, request. There's a, oh, there's a question or a comment? a question, Senator Nielsen. Uh, will these designated representatives be required to have any particular experience or training to do, do this? Senator Nielsen, there are some requirements in the legislation regarding um, who can serve as an authorized representative. For example, someone who is already legally authorized to act on the person's behalf. They typically, um, because we have other authorized representative structures in other programs such as Medi-Cal today, there are some organizations that do offer that service and do have training. If it was someone's parent or their conservator though, for example, they would have um, experience being the parent and advocating for that person, but there's no specific training called for in in the bill okay well it, it, I'm fine with uh, with having an advocate uh, it's always better if the advocate knows what they're doing though thank you thank you um, without objection we're going to move this item to a suspense file thank you, thank you. next uh, file order we have Sen senor gato Roboto. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Bregado, you have uh, two items, and you are waiving a uh, presentation on AB 210, is that correct? Absolutely. Perfect. And you do have AB 605 that has a two-pass recommendation. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, Assembly Bill 605 would clarify that the fees that we authorize, we the legislature authorized under Assembly Bill 1215, cannot be passed on to consumers buying a vehicle. This is a consumer protection measure, and I respectfully ask for your eye vote. Thank you. Witnesses in support. Mr. Chair, members, Mark Wideman on behalf of Motor Vehicle Software Comp uh, Corporation, we are in support of the bill. Mr. Right. Chairman, Jamie Price on behalf of TechNet, we're in support of the bill. Thank you. Additional witnesses in support. Witnesses in opposition, please come forward. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, John Moffat on behalf of Dealer Track and Computerized Vehicle Registration, two competing companies out in this marketplace. Uh, you know, we're opposed to the bill on policy grounds, but we have some fiscal concerns as well. Uh, the, the analysis notes minor and absorbable costs because DMV already does audits. But if you look at the regulations, they're actually self-audits under current law because DMV has the ability to regulate this one single product. This bill expands the ability of DMV to look at hundreds of other products that are not currently regulated by DMV. Uh, in the policy committee hearing on this bill, the DMV itself said the bill changes the dynamic of what the DMV would be auditing and modifies how we conduct our audits and what we would be looking at. 
now instead of just looking at this one product, they're looking at thousands of contracts, millions of transactions. It's not just electronic vehicle registration, it's financing applications for consumers. It's all those types of transactions that DMV would be auditing. So it's the audit function. DMV says, well, we have the authority and current reg to audit, but the only statement about in their auditing regs is the department may conduct a standard random, random audit to verify compliance without reimbursement from a business partner. And so we look at that and we say, well, the money for auditing has to come from somewhere. So where's it gonna come from? In addition, adoption of regulations. As I, pre as I had previously stated, DMV is greatly expanding, or this bill greatly expands the authority of DMV to look at hundreds of other products that they don't regulate. And so there's gonna be some, uh, we don't see how they could go and undertake that activity under their current regulatory authority. They're gonna need to put some structure and some borders around what it is they currently do, uh, whether it be consumer protection, privacy information, all of these other things. Who's asking for the audit? Who's saying, no, this, is be this money is being shifted around? How will we be informed of what that audit entails? All of these things that we think still need to be answered in regs before uh, we would feel comfortable subjecting our, our companies and our customers to audits under the bill. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, additional witnesses in opposition. Finance. We would concur with the Senate appropriations analysis that cost to DMV would be minor and absorbable. Thank you. Comments or questions from committee? There's a motion. Um, Senator Regardo, would you like to close? Uh, no, thank you. I respectfully ask for a vote. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Secretary, please call the roll. The motion is do pass to the Senate floor. Laura? Aye. Laura? Aye. Bates? Bell? Hill? Aye. Hill? Aye. Leva? Aye. Leva? Aye. Mendoza? Aye. Mendoza? Aye. Nielsen? Mr. Gardo, we're going to hold that uh, item open, uh, and thank you for coming. Thank you very much.